Hey everybody, today we're going to be looking into uh, the chapter on production, and that's chapter 20 in your textbook. Um, so with that, let's go and get started. We're gonna, the key concepts we're going to cover are that energy and ecosystem originates with primary production, um, autotrophs, that net primary production is constrained by both physical and biotic environmental factors. The global patterns of net primary production reflect climate constraints and biome types and uh, secondary production is generated through the consumption of organic matter by heterotrophs. So, um, quick introduction. In 1942, there was a, a really influential paper by uh, Raymond Lindemann that looked at energy transfers in a lake ecosystem. And basically, he came to, to the uh, conclusion that uh, instead of, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in, in what he did was he put uh, organisms Instead of in taxonomic categories, he grouped them based on their uh, functional categories, so how they obtained energy. And you can see uh, sort of the key figure here on the right, and in the upper um, part on both the left and right sides, you can see that this is solar radiation. So it comes in, and then he has phytoplankton. He called them; they were uh, called phytoplankters. Um, and then also pond weeds, so these emerge in vegetation. Um, and you can see that there are arrows pointing in the direction of energy flow. At the center of the, the figure is this, what he called ooze. This would just sort of be organic matter. Um, and then there's bacteria, of course, that were using that organic matter to um, for their own energy sources. So anyway, sort of uh, recategorize these, um, this idea and change from the taxonomic organization to this more functional organization. And this is uh, idea of functional uh, relationships are still used today. So the term ecosystem was first used in 1935 by Tansley. I think some of you may have done uh, work with Tansley in your one of our early assignments on historic figures of uh, ecology. And um, this was, he uh, coined the term ecosystem to refer to all the components of an eco ecological system, biotic and abiotic, that influence the flow of energy and elements. So ecosystem concept is very holistic in that it integrates ecology with other disciplines such as geochemistry, hydrology, and atmospheric sciences. So it's a very holistic uh, approach. So on to primary production. Primary production is the chemical energy generated by autotrophs during photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. And chemosynthesis is the idea that some organisms, particularly micro, uh, microorganisms um, that live in deep sea vents or hydrothermal vents, um, can actually take chemicals and not use any of the sun's energy, but they turn chemicals into, um, into uh, tissue. So uh, it, and, uh, it is the source of energy for all organisms, and that ranges from bacteria to humans. It accounts for the largest movement of carbon dioxide between the earth and the atmosphere. Uh, fossil fuels are um, also derived from primary production. So long ago, uh, they were um, part of primary production. Energy assimilated. Uh, by autotrophs is stored as carbon compounds in plant tissues, and thus carbon is the currency that we use to measure primary production. And primary productivity is the rate of primary production. So on to gross primary production, or GPP, and this is the total amount of carbon that is fixed by autotrophs. So uh, GPP is controlled by a couple of different things. One is climate, and that's through its influence on the photosynthetic rate, so you can think about um, depending on where you are on the earth, there's more uh, sunlight that reaches the earth. Remember those early chapters where we were talking about, um, about the amount of sunlight that reaches the earth in the poles versus the equator. And also you can think about temperature and um, you know that uh, biological processes take place at a much higher rate and at a higher, um, at a warmer temperature. And then uh, leaf area index, and this is the leaf area per unit of ground area. And leaf area in index uh, varies among biomes, so in the Arctic tundra, for example, it's 0.1. That means that less than 10% of the ground surface has leaf cover. And then boreal and tropical forest is equal to 12. In other words, there's 12, there are 12 layers of leaves between the canopy, uh, the top of the canopy, and the ground. And so because of shading, the incremental gain in photosynthesis of each of the added layers decreases and eventually the respira respiratory costs associated with adding leaf layers outweigh the photosynthetic, photosynthetic benefits. And so you can see this is the, um, the um, uptake, net carbon dioxide uptake, and these are the different leaf layers. So this is the uppermost leaf layer all the way down to the lowest most leaf la layer. 
and you can see that there's a decrease in the net primary productivity uptake um, and also that it changes through time and day so you'll notice one of the things i think is sort of interesting about this figure is this uh, sort of peak and then it goes down around noon and that's uh, i believe because of the angle of the sun so there's probably more sunlight penetrating to lower leaf levels when you are uh, at a bit of an angle when the sun's at a bit of an angle and then it decreases and again increases as we move through the day and i'm sure that is variable depending on uh, where you are uh, on the globe as well and also the um, time of year so plants use about half of the carbon dioxide um, that is fixed for photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Um, plants with a lot of non-photosynthetic tissues, for example, trees that have their trunks have higher respiratory uh, carbon losses. And then resp respiration rates increase with temperature, so uh, tropical forests have high respiratory losses. And then net primary production, or MPP, is equal to the gross primary production minus the, rest, the rate of respiration. And NPP is the amount of energy that's captured by autotrophs that result in increase in biomass, so an increase in plant living matter. And NPP is the energy that's left over for plant growth and for consumption by detritivores and herbivores. So plants also allocate carbon um, in different ways to different tissues, depending on where they are um, and what type of biome they live in. So you can see here in tropical forests, they may not um, allocate a lot to roots, but when you get into temperate grasslands, they spend a lot of time allocating a lot of their primary productivity towards roots. The same as in these uh, deserts and tundra areas. So this has a lot to do with sort of the local climate and uh, how much available um, water there is in areas. So it would make sense for desert animal, desert plants to spend a lot of their, um, their resources to roots so that they can um, because of the lack of, of rain, and so they need to be able to, or lack of precipitation, so they need to be able to access water from deeper soils. Uh, NPP also varies during succession, so uh, as, species, as does species composition, um, and, and species composition, leaf area index, and the ratio of photosynthetic to non-photosynthetic tissues change. So it's important to be able to measure net primary production, and it is the, uh, it's the ultimate source of energy for all or organisms in the ecosystem, so across the earth. The variation in MPP is a metric for tracking ecosystem health, and it is also associated with the global carbon cycle. So in terrestrial ecosystems, um, the, we measure, uh, measure the increase in plant biomass during the growing season by harvesting plant tissues. Um, in experimental plots. So there are actually experiments that are done that, where they can uh, measure the amount of um, plant biomass and, and knowing how much um, sunlight reaches the, the area uh, every year or during a, a given time as well. So they use these experiments to try to calculate how much um, net primary production is going on. And then harvest techniques are impractical for large or biologic, biologically diverse ecosystems. So you can think about um, those 12 layers in a tropical forest as compared to a grassland and how much more difficult it would be to try to, um, to, try to harvest and, and estimate the amount of uh, primary productivity. Um, chlorophyll concentrations in plants can be a proxy for GPP and MPP. So we can sort of get around these, um, these uh, restraints, the, the harvesting restraints, by looking at chlorophyll concentrations. And um, you can estimate these by using remote sensing methods that rely on reflection of solar radiation. So chlorophyll has a very characteristic spe spectral signature. It absorbs blue and red wavelengths and reflects green. So you can see over here in this figure on the, on the right, um, the vegetation is this sort of orange color. You can see in the, the visible spectrum here that there's low absorbance um, or, or reflectance, sorry, low reflectance, so high absorbance of the blue wavelengths and also the red wavelengths, but high um, reflectance of the green wavelength. Um, so that may end low, so low absorbance. And so that's why plants look green. And so it has this sort of signature that we can look at and it's different from the surrounding ground and soil and that type of thing. Um, and this, these indices, we've developed indices for estimating NPP from the reflection um, based on these different wavelengths. So um, one of those is what is called NDVI, or Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And NDVI is the near-infrared minus the red wavelength over the near-infrared plus the um, red 
wavelength. And um, so remote sensing can be used to estimate carbon dioxide uptake, net primary, producti and net primary productivity. Uh, we can look at deforestation, desertification, atmospheric pollution, and other various phenomena. Um, and remote sensing allows for MPP to measure, uh, be measured frequently at, at really large spatial scales. So we actually show you uh, an example now um, based on uh, the Google Earth Engine. Some of you may be familiar with this. I'm not sure. But what, um, what this does is um, it's just a GIS, a geographic information system. And you have to be able to, to code um, some, but there's a lot of help with that. So if these are the types of things you're interested in. And um, just for, for your sake to tell you, you, what I did here is the start and end date here. Um, so I'm looking for images, um, a collection of images that range from January 29th of 2017 to February, tw or I'm sorry, March 29th of 20, um, 2017. And so it will sort of combine those images because uh, sometimes the, when the satellite goes over, it may actually be cloudy. Um, so it tries to find the clearest and best images. And then it runs this, um, this process to develop the MBVI. And so um, you can see this sort of, a lot of sort of yellow um, coloration, some green, and then this sort of orange or brown coloration. And I'll say this is on the coast of South Carolina. Um, if I, uh, I won't turn that off, but this is uh, running across this area here is a light line. You may be able to see that is actually Highway 17. Um, so Charleston is further up uh, this way and Savannah is further down this direction. And so you can see this, this uh, coloration and um, I'm going to do a, um, hang on a second. So I'm going to make a copy of this, just a screenshot so we can compare it because I want to show you how it changes, colors change based on the time of year. So I'll pull this back over in just a second. All right, so we're going to change that. So this is the, the first or the um, January or March and April, um, I guess, essentially, um, or February and March of uh, 2017. And so I'm going to change this to uh, May through July. And I'm going to run it again. You can see that we get a much greener image. All right, so you can see how much greener it is. And so this is essentially saying that, um, shrink this a little bit, oops. All right, so this is essentially saying that the, um, the um, difference in these two time periods, you can see that there's much, much greater uh, primary productivity going on because of the dark green uh, in the summer months than in the uh, winter months. And that, of course, makes complete sense. But you can imagine you can compare this uh, during the same time period um, and due to different environmental conditions. So if there was an area that had been um, devastated by uh, fire or some uh, natural phenomenon or, or anthropogenic phenomenon, then you can make comparisons between the two. All right, and so again, that's um, Google Earth Engine if you're interested in uh, playing with a GIS. It's free. Um, you can, um, there's a lot of help if you're interested in that that you can access online as well. All right, um, let's see, keep going again. So um, in aquatic habitats, phytoplankton have uh, really short life lifespan, so biomass at any given time is low and harvest techniques are not used. Instead, we look at um, uh, photosynthesis and respiration are measured with water samples incubated on site with light um, for photosynthesis and without light for respiration. And the difference is the rate is equal to uh, MPP. And so these uh, images, which actually don't look very good, but you can see these dark bottles and these light bottles. And these would be submerged in, uh, in a lake, allowed to sort of uh, estimate, or I'm sorry, allowed to um, equilibrate with the local temperature and then you would measure dissolved oxygen in the two different um, containers and you come up with an idea of how much primary productivity was um, was um, produced during that time period because of the difference in respiration and photosynthesis. 
Uh, MPP varies over space and time, mostly cor correlated with climate. MPP increases as pre precipitation increases up to a point. So high precipitation levels, heavy cloud cover results in less light. Nutrients can be leached from the soils and wet soils can become hypoxic. In other words, without oxygen. Uh, MPP varies over space and time, mostly correlated with climate. MPP increases as precipitation increases up to a, a point. Um, so at high precipitation levels, uh, I already said that. Um, so if you look at this image on the right, and this should uh, talk about temperature. So typically, uh, MPP increases with increasing temperature. So you can see the annual precipitation uh, as the, there's a rapid increase as you get more and more precipitation up to a point, and then there's a gradual decrease as there's more cloud cover and more uh, hypoxic soils. And then with temperature, there's a steady increase in um, in net primary productivity based on temperature. Uh, of course, this would eventually uh, start to decline as well if the temperature got too hot. Um, climate influence on net pr primary productivity can also be indirect, mediated by factors such as nutrient availability. There have been a lot of experiments uh, that indicate that nutrients, particularly nitrogen, control net primary productivity and terrestrial ecosystems particularly. Um, and net primary productivity in lakes often limit, is often limited by phosphorus and the nitrogen availability. Uh, remember in the uh, lecture about, um, about alternate ecosystems or alternate, alternate stable states, we talked about uh, an example where uh, nitrogen and phosphorus leached into, into the lakes and you get an increase in a lot of um, primary productivity and so it can change the, the, the system a lot, uh, even into an alternate system. And then in rivers and streams, net primary productivity is also often really low. So most of the energy is actually derived from terrestrial organic matter. And the image on the right is a classic paper in aquatic ecology uh, called the river continuum concept. And it describes the importance of in-stream NPP as the river flows downstream. And so what you, ha what you have is that there's a lot of input from leaf litter in these high sort of mountain streams, early uh, first order streams and second order streams. And uh, a lot of the uh, organisms that, that depend on those th that leaf litter um, are the tritivores, and then those get eaten by things like trout as you move further downstream, smallmouth bass. As the um, stream opens up, and there's also a lot of shading in this area, so there's not a lot of sunlight to penetrate uh, to the stream. And then as you move further down, the stream gets wider, you get more vascular hydrophytes. Um, further down you go, you get the, a different community of um, uh, macroinvertebrates and you get a fish community that changes as well. As you move further downstream even more, you get more and more um, changes in the in the system and like there and there's a lot of different um, inputs from the, from the, the land. So you get a lot of fine particulate organic matter as opposed to a lot of coarse organic matter in the upper system. Uh, so this is sort of a classic image of how um, streams change in this very um, predictable fashion as you move from headwaters to the, to the mouth of the, the river at the ocean. Um, on to global patterns of net primary productivity. Remote sensing data provide rapid direct measurements of NPP, providing an estimate of the Earth's capacity to take up carbon dioxide. Uh, global NPP is about 105 petagrams of carbon per year. That's quite a lot. 54% uh, of this taken up by terrestrial systems and 46 by oceans. The highest rates of MPP on land are typically found in the tropics where the growing season uh, is long and the, there's high precipitation, so it really promotes uh, high rates of MPP. And then ocean, oceanic MPP peaks at the mid-latitudes, and this is because of the upwelling of, the, of uh, ocean currents. Uh, that bring nutrient-rich, rich, uh, cold, deep waters from the from deep oceans to the surface, and so there's a lot of nutrients that's available. And so you can see that in this image on the right. If we look at um, the uh, oceanic uh, productivity, you can see the blue line, and so at these mid latitudes, around um, between um, about 45 degrees, is is um, is where things max out, and the same in the um, in the southern hemisphere. And then, um, of course, in the um, tropics, right at the zero latitude, you see the greatest amount of net primary productivity in terrestrial systems. So the overall the sort of um, net primary productivity based on latitude looks, looks like this for the entire Earth. Um, variation in net primary productivity in terrestrial biomes is associated mostly with the leaf area index and length of growing season. 
the variation in uh, MPP in aquatic systems is primarily related to the variation in nutrient inputs. So on to secondary production. And secondary production is uh, energy derived from consuming organic compounds produced by other organisms, uh, eating other organisms. So uh, heterotrophs include all of the groups that are include archaea, bacteria, fungi, and animals. And of course, there are a few uh, plants that are carnivorous. And so heterotrophs, uh, more specifically, there are um, four different types of herbivores, and these are uh, things that eat plants and algae. Carnivores, they eat other live animals. Detritivores, they eat dead organic matter or detritus. And then omnivores eat both plants and animals. Um, one of the ways that scientists um, evaluate what, what animals eat is through stable isotopes. Um, so they can, they can look at um, the ratios of naturally occurring isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur and how they differ among potential food items. And the isotopic composition of heterotroph is compared with potential food sources. So um, there was a uh, study that your textbook looks at looking at cave bears, and the idea was that originally cave bears were thought to eat mostly um, vegetation. But if they compared their diet, they see that um, it was more, it was about 58% composed of a meat diet. Um, and so they had a, a higher nitrogen to carbon ratio uh, as opposed to um, those known Pleistocene herbivores that had a, a, a lower nitrogen to carbon ratio. So some organic matter consumed by heterotrophs is used in respiration and some is uh, lost through ingestion. And net secondary production is uh, equal to ingestion minus respiration minus ingestion. So it's sort of intake minus output. And then net secondary production depends on the quality of food and digestibility and nutrient content and physiology. And animals with high respiration rates, such as endotherms, have less energy left over to allocate to growth. And um, net secondary production is most, in most ecosystems, is a small fraction of MPP. The fraction is a little bit higher in aquatic systems. Uh, most of the net secondary production is associated with the tritophores, and primarily uh, those are bacterial and fungi. And so there's uh, a lot of energy that's available uh, tied up in, in um, detritus that is available for these bacteria and fungi. And with that, uh, we'll move on to the next chapter, which will be chapter 21, I think, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys again soon.